Okay, we're gonna look at stress. Slash strain transformation. Okay, so let me give you what is the reason to do this stuff, right? So from solid mechanics. Probably you have studied that there is the ASTM, American Standard Testing Machine, all right, to, to test the material properties. Okay, and Johnny, the material, I don't know if you have done it on the lab or not, but Johnny, you have that machine can be whatever you want, but I would have an arm like this. I'm guessing he would have something to hold a specimen. Okay, whatever, I make it not over here, whatever you want. Okay, so this is the STM machine. And what happened is that then this you pull, you put this member in tension over here, okay? And from this experiment, you will get the stress and strain curve, which basically would be linear. You would find a linear region, then something like this and like this for elastic material. And this would be the elastic range, this would be the yield, and the slope of this curve is what is defined as the modulus of elasticity. Okay, but what is important over here is that if we look at the stresses of this specimen over here, okay, so on the specimen, So this specimen over here, Johnny, you would call a strain gauge, but basically would be a force. What be the type of stresses that this specimen would be submitted? It would be unidirectional loading, so unidirectional loading, slash stress. So if we look at what happened in one little element over here, basically that element is just subjected to normal stresses in that direction. Okay. And from this curve, let's talk about static. It's easy to understand. And let's say about aluminum or steel, you know, that can uh, deform. This point over here, Jenny, would be what? Would be the sigma yield. So basically, this would be more like uh, the brittle material. They would break because they would not elongate, they would be very low. But then what happened? If you have a very plastic material, the after deformation, the structure will break at the ultimate stress. Okay, so what's important here to understand is that these values that you find experimentally are obtained using the ASTM machine that is only loading the specimen in one direction, okay? So basically the stresses will only be given to you in the direction of the loading, okay? But now what happens? If uh, a structure
has, let's say, the following. Loading. So imagine the problem we have been doing. Let's say you have a beam. Okay, so this beam will be subjected, whatever you want, a distributed load, a local load, a moment, whatever you want. So now, what happened? If we look at one small element, one small element over here, it will have some stresses. So let's say the state of stresses for this one, I mean, it's not gonna be like that, but let's say you might have stresses over here on the one direction or on the X direction, stresses on the Y direction. So this should be in order to be in equilibrium, you have the opposite. You can have shear stresses. Okay, and this could be acting at any angle. Okay, so let's say stresses acting in every direction. So you see this element will be subjected to stresses on the X, Y, and shear. Now, so let's say you want to estimate when is this beam going to break or to fail? Can you just say you take the maximum sigma X and compare it to the sigma yield over here? Does that make sense? That doesn't make sense because this one is also has a sigma Y, no? And this one has stresses in every single direction. So what we need to be able to do is to transform this element here into some type of element like this one. And that's not something new. That's probably something you have done in solid mechanics is what is called the stress and strain transformation. Okay, you can transform an element of stress like this into an element of stress like this. So now you can convert these values over here with the ones obtained from the uh, testing. Okay. All right. So I'm not going to do the detailed derivation. Say detail. Derivation can be found in uh, class notes, I would probably put them online or, or online, anywhere you want, okay? Okay, so I found here a website where you can find multiple ones about stress transformation. Uh, then you start from this element, you make a cut and you do summation of forces, X and Y, and you find the relation between the stresses on the X axis and the X prime axis. And okay, this is what we're gonna get. So if you do that, let's say I'm gonna do here a little figure and I will go to the next page. So we have the X and Y coordinate system. And now we're gonna do a rotation, X prime, Y prime. And let's say we're gonna rotate this one by an angle theta. Okay. So it's not complicated, it's just tedious, but if you do summation of forces on the X, summation of forces on the Y, you're gonna get two relations. You get that sigma X prime, X prime, will be equal to sigma x x cosine square 
theta plus sigma y y sine square theta plus two times tau x y sine theta cos theta. And let's call this equation here one in case we need it. Okay, and the other equation we can find is that sigma xy y prime would be equal to sigma yy minus sigma xx sine theta cos theta plus tau xy cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta. Okay, so basically this what this is doing, if I do a figure, a quick figure. Oops. Uh, what is doing? This is just giving you the relations. If you want to go, let's say from this type of system. Okay, plus you have here tau. Let's see, we wanna move it here to a sigma x prime x prime. Okay, so you can go from one to the other. Okay, and here would be the Okay, so basically you can go back and forth from one to the other. Okay. So now that you know the stresses in any orientation Using this, these two equations, you can find what was defined as the principal stresses and maximum shear. Okay. So to find the maximum stresses, okay, in mathematics, how do you find, if you have a function, how do you find the maximum or the minimum of a function? What do you do? You take the derivative, okay? So this is what we're gonna be doing here. So if we take the derivative of sigma, let's say x prime, x prime, and this is changing with respect to what? To the angle of rotation equal to zero. So if you do that, you take this expression here, you take the derivative and you do some, I will put class notes online. I will put detailed class notes online, okay? On Canvas, so don't worry about it. I'm not interested in doing the division. 
that should have been done in solids. You're gonna get a relation here that you find tangent of two theta of the maximum stress angle that would be the principal is equal to tau xy divided by sigma xx minus sigma yy divided by two. So basically I'm gonna do another figure to see if you kind of remember this a little bit. Okay, this will be the maximum stress. The maximum principal stress will be at an angle of two theta P1. So this will be the maximum value and here you will have sigma two that would be the minimum value. Okay, so I'm gonna do some step of the procedure, but basically, what is the good thing about sigma one now? Well, what would that happen? What we're doing now is what we're talking before. We're going from an element of stress that would be like this, and we're gonna end up with an element of stress like this. Okay, that's the whole thing. All right, so let me give you some relation about these angles. These angles are related as two theta, P2 equals to 2 theta P1 plus 180. So theta P2 is equal to principal angle plus 90 degrees. So if I put it on the figure here, basically we'll have this one here. Okay, it's this one here, up to here, plus 180, no? All right. Okay, so similarly, we're gonna have two relations. So again, I'm gonna be quick. I don't give much details, but I wanna give you at least some, some details. We also gonna have the relations cosine two theta P1, so you get this stuff from the figure, will be equal to what? Sigma XX minus Sigma YY divided by two, Sigma XX minus Sigma YY divided by two square plus tau x y square square root and sine two theta p one is equal to tau x y divided by the same thing sigma x x minus sigma y y divided by two everything square plus tau xy square. You take the square root. Okay, so the next step is to substitute. I don't do the algebra, but substitute. Substitute. 
substituting above expressions into equation one, which is this equation here, okay? You get the two expression for the principal stresses, sigma one, two, equal to sigma x, x plus sigma y, y divided by two plus minus the square root of sigma x, x minus sigma y, y, divided by two squared plus tau x, y squared. Okay, so maybe you remember or not, but this is the expression for the principal stresses. Okay, and basically I want to do another figure, the relation between, if you look at this expression here, all right, the relation of this stuff is just this is the angle, the principal angle, this is tau xy, this is sigma xx minus sigma yy, divided by two, and using the Pythagorean theorem, this is square, okay? This side over here, do it better than me. This side is just the Pythagorean theorem. And something that I personally, when I used to teach solid mechanics, I did not spend much time about it because I think nowadays it's a bit useless with all the computers, but maybe some faculty love to do it and probably you remember it. What am I sketching here? The more circle. So what is the more circle? The more circle is relate the stresses to the strain. And you can look, just look here at the at the angle, no? Yeah? So basically, if you do the, uh, this, this, uh, if you use the more circle, what happens is that you prove that you can rewrite this equation as the equation of a circle, okay? And then you start learning the value of, whatever, how to use the more circles. But I don't have anything against the more circle, but nowadays, how difficult it is to plot this equation into, the software and see the, all the values for the different tetas. Takes you very, it's very quick, no? Okay, so I think more circle is good, but I don't think nowadays is needed that much. Okay, so similarly, in order to find, let me go to the next page. So we found the maximum normal stress to find max minimum shear stress what do we do we do exactly the same thing but this time the shear is the x prime y prime Remember, sigma xy is the same as tau xy, okay? Just different notation. And we take this one with respect to theta. This would be equal to zero. So same as before, I don't do the details, see class notes. I would put some of my class notes with all the derivations. You find that tangent to theta of the shear angle is equal to, minus sigma xx minus sigma yy 
divided by two divided by tau x y. And this should be page one of this. Okay, so if I do the figure, this will look as before, this would be tau. This would be the angle. It's the same as before. This would be tau max. This would be tau minimum. This will be the two sigma s one. So we'll have, let's see how the, what did I use before to do it? Okay, the blue two sigma s two will be equal to two shear s one plus 180 which gives you that the shear stress two, which is equal to shear one plus 90. Okay, so it will be this one here. Okay, and at the end, you do some more algebra and you find that the maximum minimum shear is given by the expression plus minus sigma x x minus sigma y y divided by two square plus tau x y square. So this will be the max min shear stress. Okay. And finally, I will quick, there's a relation between the principal stresses. This is sigma one minus sigma two divided by two and the minimum shear stress is sigma two minus sigma one divided by two. So like I was saying, uh, I just opened a model here in 2D. And if you want, let's do that again. Uh, you see here, this is a plate. We saw the other day on the class note that if you have a hole, you need to multiply by, by stress coefficient, uh, concentration factor of three. And here you see the value of the stress is about one, it's on the blues. And if you go to the maximum red, it's about the order of three. But again, this is not why I opened this file, it's just to show you, to show you here that the outputs that you can get from the final element are the normal stresses that we know how to do, the shear stress, but then you see the first thing they calculate is the principal stress, and then the maximum shear stress, the expression we, that we have, and something we're gonna have to do later is to find the volumetric stresses, okay? All right, so let's do a quick example. It's just like a review. Okay, and then we move to something more serious. So example. All 
Okay, so imagine you have a, a circular shaft. It really doesn't matter the shape. I just do it this way because it's just faster. And on this shaft, so again, imagine that this is a beam that I give you a very complicated loading and you find what is the sigma X, you find what is the sigma Y, you find what is the shear, no? Okay, so this would be the next step, all right? So the next step, if you take this element at this location over here, all right? You will find that this element here, if I do it here bigger, you find out that it's subjected to a stress in that direction and that direction. Uh, 100 megapascal, so this will be your sigma y. The sigma x, you will find out that actually this is in compression of 50 megapascals and this one we have a shear equal to 75 megapascals So again, these stresses can be, you see, they're all combined all over the places. So our goal is to do what? We are here. Our goal is gonna, is gonna be to find for the same element, sigma one, and sigma two, okay? And this obviously will be rotated a certain angle. All right. So the question here is to determine, this is really the question, so determine the Principal stresses. So, what does that mean? I mean, I put it over there. That means in our equation, sigma xx will be equal to minus 50 megapascals. Sigma yy will be equal to 100 megapascals. And tau and yeah, and uh, tau xy, which will be, yeah, will be equal to 75 megapascal. So again, this is a very simple example. So if we substitute into the expression for the principal stresses, which is this one over here, sigma xx plus sigma yy divided by two, plus minus sigma xx minus sigma yy divided by two, everything squared plus tau xy squared. So this is equal to what? Minus 50 plus 100 divided by two plus minus, minus 50 minus 100 divided by two, everything square plus 75 square, square root. So I give you the results. I have them here, sigma one would equal to 131.1 megapascals and sigma two will be equal to minus 81.1 megapascals. Okay.
Okay, so we found these values. Now we need to find the angle. Okay, so we're going to use the expression that we used before for the tangent. Okay, so next we use the expression tangent two theta p one equal to tau x y divided by sigma x x minus sigma one y divided by two. So this gives us seventy five divided by minus 50 minus 100 divided by two, which gives that tangent two theta principal is just one. So this one looks easy. So is that true? Yeah, this is minus 150 divided by two is minus 75. 75 divided by minus 75 is equal to minus one. Or this means that two theta p one would be equal to minus forty five degrees. I mean, I hope you know how to do that on your calculator. No, you do the adjacent or the inverse tangent. So this will give you that theta p one to be equal to minus twenty two point five degrees. And maybe I could have done here the same thing with this. All right, and we knew that the principal stress two will be equal to one plus 90. So this will give us that the uh, Angle for the second principal stress to be 67.5 degrees. Okay, so here maybe I did a miss, I mean, not a mistake, but I cannot give you the answer already telling you about which angle was the solution. But this is not always the case. I mean, it's, sometimes it can be reversed. So what is the way to check which angles correspond to uh, sigma one or sigma two? So let's see. Check. So in this case is check, but Johnny would be identify. Which angle corresponds to sigma one and sigma two? So let's see, actually, yeah, I don't know, maybe. Okay, so which way you do that? So you take the equation, sigma x prime x prime, the one we had initially is sigma x x cosine square theta plus sigma y y sine square theta plus tau x y sine two theta. So this is the original equation. So first case for theta, let's say it will be theta P1, which is negative 22.5. So if we substitute into the above equation, we will get one. So sigma x we say was equal to uh, is here, so it's nearly fifty. Of 
cosine square of negative 22.5 sigma yy so plus 100 sine square negative 22.5 plus 75 sine of negative 45. So if you do this calculation, you find that sigma x prime x prime is equal to minus 81.1 megapascal. And that's actually which one? This is the sigma two, no? So you see in this case, you know, I should have not put P1 because actually the P1 is the P2 which is this one is actually related to the sigma two. So what does that mean? That the sigma P1 equal to negative 22.5 is related to the sigma two equal to minus 81.1 megapascals. And that the sigma P2 that is equal to what? 67.5 degrees is related to the sigma one that is equal to 131.1. Okay, so why are we doing all this stuff? So from solid, Probably you remember that you had to plot this type of figure over here. So you had our initial figure will be the state of the stress that we had. So let's plot it as it is. Here is we had sigma xx equal to 50 in compression. We had Sigma yy equal to 100 in tension. And then we had the shear to be equal to 75. Okay, so this is equal. So let's see, what do we have from the previous figure? We had that the sigma one, sigma one, which is the 131, this one here correspond to the 67.5, okay? So that means that if we do it here, sigma one, sigma one, this will be at an angle of, Sixty-seven point five. All right, and then the sigma two will be in compressions this way. And you have different ways to plot this, but if you do it the way it is, got it done the way we have done it should be negative 22.5. So this should be here, this angle will be negative 
Okay, so what is the whole conclusion why we are doing all this stuff? It's because in this case over here is the element is subjected to normal stresses sigma x sigma y and shear stress tau x y Now, if you remember, this curve over here is for unidirectional stresses, no? So all these stresses are very beautiful, very nice to get them, but in this state, we cannot do anything with them to, to draw a conclusion for our design. We need to be able to put them into an action that they're only acting in one direction of the element, no? Okay, so that's where we do the principal stresses. We get here, and now we're gonna get here. So here the element, in this case, is subjected to stresses sigma one, sigma two, which are unidirectional only. So now what can you do? You could take, I mean, I don't know, depending on the design, but you can take either the maximum or the minimum of these ones and compare with one of these values, no? For your design to find out if it's safe or not. But it would not be safe to take the sigma X over here or the sigma Y, if your loading is complex. Okay. All right, so now we're gonna look at the failure and this is important failure of brittle and ductile materials. Okay, so this is important. I mean, this is probably one of the most important thing to remember from this class. So, Let's first look at a doctor material. So doctor material means what? Is that the element is gonna follow This line over here. Okay, so you can go from here to here because the element will go to the yield, then it will deform, and then it will keep deforming again until uh, until it fails. So again, will be you will have a yield value here, and you will have an ultimate value over here. Okay, so that means that you will have an elastic region, and that you will have a plastic region, okay, of the formation. Now, what is a brittle material?
So an example of ductile material will be aluminum, okay? Most of the steels, not all of them, but uh, most of the steels. So in this case, a brittle material will be an example of brittle material. I believe the easiest one will be glass, okay, or any ceramic. So in this case, what's gonna, what happens with a brittle material? Let's say glass or a ceramic. They do not deform, no? Either they are not broken or they are broken, no? Okay? So basically, then it will be a small value over here. It's not gonna go all the way up, okay? Because this will mean that it will deform. Then it will break within, I think it's the first 3%, okay? Of the, this one. So what's important here to remember is that experiments, I've shown that, and this is the important part, one, ductile materials will fail you to shear stress to brittle materials will fail due to normal stress. Okay, so that's probably not in, intuitive at all, but this is what the actually the experiment I've shown and only the experiment, okay? It's the equations we just derived actually will show it to you, okay? With some understanding. So let's see, we can do the first example and I will stop over there. Not planning on doing all the examples. All right, let's try to do one quick example. Okay, so we're gonna look at a bar within, but let's say bar in pure shear. Okay, so now to have a bar in pure shear, let's say we take a bar. And what we do is apply a, but this one we create a torque, so. Okay, a torque T. And here we're gonna have a small element. So if we look at our elements, if that element is in pure shear, What does that mean? Is that it would just be subjected to this type of loading over here. Okay, so that, what does that mean? That sigma 
x, x will be zero, sigma y, y will be zero, and that tau x, y is equal to tau. So if we substitute into the principal stress equation, Okay, what would you get? Sigma one, two equal to zero plus, my, plus minus tau. So this is very simple. This will give you that sigma one equal to tau, sigma two equal to minus tau. Okay, now let's go down a little bit. Let's say you have a, whatever, a brittle, a brittle material, okay? And you twist it. I don't know, think about, I mean, people don't, did you use shark in schools in order to write on the boards or not? Or maybe when you were kids, what happened if you twist it? If you put in your hand and you twist it, how is it going to break? Remember how it breaks? No idea? I mean, if you break it this way, you can break it this way, but you could also break it by twisting it. What was happening when you were breaking it by twisting it? Okay, you remember? Let's see what the math should tell us, okay? And maybe it will agree. Okay, so we found the principal stresses. Now we need to find out the angle at which these ones will occur, no? Okay. All right. So we substitute now into the other equation, which is tangent to theta p1 equals to tau divided by sigma xx minus sigma yy divided by 2. So this gives us basically what the uh, tau divided by zero, which this is equal to sine one. I mean, I don't know why I'm doing this, it's not really needed. Okay, so we have this. I know, I know why I wrote this. Okay. So if we look at this expression here, at the bottom, we know that cosine, let that be one, is equal to zero, which this will give you what? Two theta p one, should be equal to what? When is cosine equal to zero? At zero or 180, no? If you have the circle. If you have a circle, where is the cosine zero? Here and here, no? Sorry, the cosine is zero, yeah, you're right. This is one, sorry, it's here and here. Absolutely right, here top and bottom, okay? So this will give you what for the angle then? So it will give you, this one should be equal, let's say to 90 degrees, no? It will go to the top, 
which will mean just like you say that the principal so this will occur at 45. Okay, and if you want, we can do the other one, but that's not important. This is really important. We'll have plus 90, which will give you that equals to 135 degrees. Okay, now let's see once, well, why did I wrote this expression now this with this over here? Why did I not write tangent of two theta P one equal to zero? Because it's not true, no? When you divide something by zero, it's not equal to zero, it becomes infinite, okay? So in order really to solve this one, you need to recognize that this one will be zero, no? Okay, but again. Uh, so what does that mean? So how is the bar going to break? It's going to break at a value of sigma principal equal to the shear. No? Okay. And at what angle? So it could be 45 or minus 45. So it will break probably this way, no? So is that true? If you take the piece, the piece of shock when your kids and you twist it, how will it break? At an angle, no? Of 45 degrees. So that's what the math are showing, no? And now, what was our experiment will say? Brittle materials will fail due to normal stresses. So now we still have to prove that one. So this will be here 45, 45. Okay. okay, so we do as before for the angle equal to V1, which is 45 degrees. If we go and substitute into this equation here, the x prime x prime, which is that's not going to be faster. All right, so this is zero. This is zero. So from here, we get that sigma x prime x prime is equal to, so will be tau xy, which is equal to tau, okay? And in this case would be equal to, so that this will mean that sigma one, equal to that. Okay, so, and this problem is 45 related to sigma one, sigma two equal to 135, equal to sigma two, but both of them will be equal to tau anyway. So just here, minus tau. So we do the same figure as before. What does that mean? That if we have an element in pure shear,
and we just want to have the so it will be sigma one sigma one and an angle of 45 and this would be two sigma two and an angle of 135. Okay, so that will be Give me two minutes, it will be the last thing we do. So, uh, plotting sigma x prime x prime equal to sigma xx cosine square theta plus sigma yy sine square theta plus tau xy sine two theta. So if you plot this one, you're going to get something like this. Okay, and it will keep going. So you will find out that this is when is the stress maximum? When is the normal stress maximum? At 45 and 135. So what happened at 45 and 135? That's when the normal stress is maximum, okay? So if you remember, what was the assumption that we had before? Brittle materials will fail due to normal stress. Okay, so we find out that this will fail at 45 and 135. What is maximum at 35 and 135 is the normal stress. Okay, so above figure. So ratifies the assumption that brittle materials will, I'm gonna put generally fail you to normal stress. Okay, and just one last thing to understand it. Now, physically, why is it breaking due to normal stress? When you twist something, okay, I know it's hard to, to understand to maybe figure, but if you twist something, what's gonna happen? By twisting, you might make it a little bit shorter, no? Yeah? So if you make it a bit shorter, what are you doing? What are the forces acting? Will be the one on the plane that will be the normal stresses, no? Yeah? So if you take a bit of material and by twisting it, you change a bit the length in the axis, it's gonna break due to the normal stress as given in this figure over here. 
Yeah. So does everything kind of make sense a little bit at least? All right, so we stop over here.